at the book of Exodus. I better jump on this sermon because I can tell I could pass this mic and I could get a few sermons this morning. Exodus chapter 3, verses 16 through 22, as we continue to walk through this wilderness experience with the children of Israel. Exodus 3, verse 16 through 22. And it reads, Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you. And have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hattites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hathites, and Jebusites. A land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. God, we thank you. We bless you for your word. You could have made it so lofty that we couldn't understand it, but you put it on our level. Then empowered us to receive it. God, we thank you now that it will come forth with clarity and with application. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 May we see the presence of the Lord. I want to tag this text with this title. The no is not to stop you. That's right. Amen. The no, N-O. The no is not to stop you. Don't pull off your mask. We just look at somebody. We're in the black church and point at them. You can keep your mask on. They can tell it through your eyes. Y'all grew up at a time when somebody could just look at you at church and look you into the Holy Ghost. And just let somebody know the no is not to stop you. People of, people of all generations have so well elaborated that there seems to be one of three answers to every prayer. Right the sages of times, past and present, say yeah. that when we pray that God either responds with yes, no, or wait. Now, though I do not know if that is completely accurate, because the character of God is so vast that we cannot lock God's responses into human understanding. God could have said maybe. Or let me think about it. The reality of whether we accept the other three responses are just inbred into life. If God says yes, wonderful. If God says no, I mean, what you going to do about it? What you gonna do about it? And if God says wait, you ain't got no choice. You see, we've been living long enough and living long enough with God that we've been able to deal with those yeses, those no's, those waits, those maybe even those maybe's or let me think about it. That's not the issue for us. 
The issue for us is when God tells us to do something and then someone or something gets in the way and provides a no that blocks us from doing seemingly what God has told us to do. That's a major problem to absorb. Yeah, yeah. We, we, it's, it's, it's a major problem to absorb. And this is the essence. If God tells us to do something, then we just believe the way will be made, the path will be clear, the resources will be provided, and the journey will be prepared all along the way. If God told us to do something, we just expect doors to be open, that people will show up at the right time and with the right resources. But get this, here's the reality. The reality is that sometimes God calls us to do something and the first obstacle we meet is a no. God told you it's time to buy a home. You save your money, cleaned up your credit as much as you could. It was up there. It was good enough and went to the bank after God told you to buy a home. You went to the bank and the bank said, God told you to open a business. And you have been over and over again at the certified or licensing agents and they keep rejecting your application. God says, time to return to school. And you're excited. And don't get in. Yeah. If God says cross the sea, we expect to see the open. But what happens when God says cross the sea? But the sea says I'm not going to open. If God says wait, if God says yes, if God says no, we can deal with that. But when we know God has called us to do something, but yet there's a, a no standing in front of us from somebody or something. Uh, am I preaching to myself this morning? <laughs> let, me, let me see. Let me see if I can make it live. Uh, the year was around 1983 or so, and I was a student at the University of South Alabama, located in Mobile, yay, 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 Mobile, Alabama. Spent my time studying that Krispy Kreme donut because when the light comes on, it's a sanctified moment. I just thought I would throw that in. I was at the University of South Alabama, in school because I wanted, you know, you know, I wanted to become a physician. I, I majored in what was then called medical technology. And I, I had already been preaching for two or three years and planned to continue to preach, uh, but wanted to be a physician. Yeah. And I was on my way. Yet I had an epiphany because of several, several experiences that had happened to me and one day while walking across campus it just hit me as if God was just talking right there with me that I was to change my major and prepare for ministry. Amen. I was convinced of that. I was so sure of that as if God had come to walk with me. But I couldn't do it at that particular school. They didn't have anything about ministry. And I worked through my own disappointments of giving up what I perceived to be a white coat life one day and decided, <laughs> yeah, Deacon Mount, I had seen enough broke preachers. I didn't want to be a... I'd heard my mama talk about the earth is the Lord and all the cattle on a thousand and ain't none of them cows showed up at our dinner table. I'd had enough of that. I was done with that. <laughs> but I decided to put all of that aside because I felt God working. That God wanted me to study for ministry. So I applied to Mobile College, what is now known as the University of Mobile. But I, I applied there because not only did I believe God wanted me to change my focus, but I felt that was the school where God wanted me to apply. It was one of those moments when it seemed that everything was falling into place. Right place. School was in the same city, and I wanted to be in Mobile. I had had enough of Beatrice. It was the right time. I felt I had heard the Spirit of God. 
It was the right move because if God had spoken and I was yielding, it was the right thing to do. It was even the right confirmation because I had spoken with another preacher and he shared with me of how the school had been a blessing to him. See, the University of Mobile, Mobile College at the time had a program where I could study to prepare for ministry. I told my mama, I'm transferring to Mobile College. Right. Told my sisters because I was using her car, I'm transferring to Mobile College. Yeah. Told my brothers, they didn't give a hoot, but I told them anyway, I'm transferring to Mobile College. Told my ministry of friends, I'm getting ready to study the Bible like never before. Told my friends that I was in college with, bye-bye, I'll see you after a while. And I applied. Paid my little 10 bucks, that's what it was back then. Mm -hmm. Paid my little money for the application. And I was filled with excitement when I received the letter in the mail from the college. No doubt my acceptance letter. Because it was from the Office of Admission. I was excited to open that letter. And here's what the letter said from my memory. Dear Charlie Stallworth, thank you for your application to pursue studies at Mobile College. Hiya. At this time, we regret to inform you that your application has not been accepted. Wait, whoa, that, that thing floored me. God, didn't we just have this conversation, God? Didn't we just decide this the way we should go? And now this school is saying, no, what was that whole walk across campus? What was this whole interruption about? I, now I done told mama, I done told uh, brother, I, I told sister, I felt like I heard from you. I'm convinced this is what you said. And now? They are saying, you know how you, I don't know if you ever got something in the mail and you pick it up and shake it and turn it around and you read it again to see if you misread it. Yeah. Oh man, it crushed me, it left me in a state of confusion. But get this, here's what I've come to learn from scripture and from life, every no is not to stop you. Text that to somebody. Every no is not to stop you. Tweet that every no is not to stop you. Email that every no is not to stop you. Post that every no is not to stop you. Tell yourself every no is not to stop you. Come, 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 come with me to this text. Moses is on the backside of the desert. He sees this bush burning that does not burn up. He hears the voice of God telling him exactly what God wants done. The message is very clear. Go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. God, my will for my people is not to be oppressed. My will for my people is not to be slaves. My will for my people is not to live less than what I called them to deal. To live. Let my people go. God is clear with intent and purpose. Moses, you go. Say and do what I'm saying. Act now. But get this. Moses... When you get there, Pharaoh is going to say no. This is bared out too in Exodus 3 and 19. Says, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. But I know that the king of Egypt would not let you go. Then Exodus 5, 1 and 2 says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? That I should obey him and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not. I didn't make it up. And I will not let Israel go. Can you hear Moses, God? Why approach me on the backside of the desert? Why set this bush on fire? Why turn my life upside down? Why are we even having this conversation if the answer is going to be no? 
Let's get to another part of the plan. The lesson is so clear that you got to recognize if I can make up a word that some knows you get in life are not intended to stop you. Now come here, now come here real close. Come here real close. Come here, come here, come here, come here real close, real close, because I want to make the record clear. Just, just for the record, let, let, let me be clear because of the climate in the world that we live in. When it comes to someone's personal space and decision they make concerning what they will or will not do with their bodies, when she tells you no, or he tells you no, it means no. Does not mean I'm thinking about it. Does not mean wait. It means no. That is not the no that I'm speaking about this morning. And I want to be very clear. <laughs> not at all. But as you go through life reaching your dreams and reaching your goals, reaching your ambitions, please do not believe God is against you or God lied to you because God tells you to do something and then you go out and the first answer you hear is a no. Priest, all with I'm standing up. I believe I will. So what, what, what are we to do? What are we to do when we encounter that no? Well, the first thing we got to do is embrace the assurance, not insurance, but embrace the assurance. Right now, at this moment, in this second, you got to embrace the assurance. Look at the assurance in the text. Exodus 3 and 16, Moses says, go, God says, go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I've watched over you and have seen what has been done to you. Get this, God is so smart. The first thing God tells Moses to do is to assure the people that I've been watching them. Assure the people that I see what has been done to them. What, what, what do you mean assure the people? God says to Moses, give them the assurance that I am God and that I am watching even if I haven't done anything about it yet. Woo, I wish I could preach right down through in there. Assure them that I am God, I am watching even if I have not done anything about it yet. God says, I'm not giving you your dreams that you desire, but I've been keeping the fire burning in your heart. And I've not allowed you yet to pay off that bill you've been trying to pay off, but I'm still keeping you a hope that you will pay it off. I've not provided you with the home that you want to live in, but I keep working on it. You don't know I'm working on it. The assurance is that even though God has not changed, it does not mean God is not working on it. God says cancel did come foreclosure did show up repossession did take place but don't think I had my eyes closed don't think I was somewhere away on vacation I want you to know that I'm watching yeah. Woo! Yeah. I want you to give you the assurance that you are not in this by yourself that I'm working this thing out with you yeah. don't focus on the no but focus on the assurance that I know he walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me. All of us familiar, or most of us at least familiar with that poem, Footprints in the Sand, that the man complains that God, when life was rough, I only saw one set of prints. And God responds, you only saw one set of prints when life was rough because at those times I didn't allow you to walk alone. But I picked you up and I carried you. That's, that's the assurance when you are facing a no, that's the assurance that you have to hold on to. Not so much focusing on the no, but to know God knows and God is watching even if God has not done anything about it yet. Yeah. Somebody all just throw your hand up and say, God, thank you that I know you're watching. 
Thank you. Embrace the assurance that everything is going on in your life right now. That God's watching. And God is not pleased with the pain that somebody else is putting you through. Mm. But not only do we embrace the assurance, number two, when we face that, no, we have to embrace the promise. Because there's a promise in the text. There's not only assurance, but there's a promise. Exodus 3 and 17, and I have promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into a land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hittites, all them ites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. God says, I'm not just watching, I'm not just looking, but I'm making you a promise now that I'm going to do something about it. Now, I know, I know, I, I know we're smart now, and we're students of hermeneutics. I, 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 I understand. I, yeah, I've been practicing how to pronounce it. Hermeneutics, you know, we, 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 we place our own uh, sits in Laban. Yeah, I'm going to get smart here in a minute. Until the historical context of the pericope. And then we say, that was for them. But it's not for us. And you can't take somebody else's promise and make it apply to you. I, I agree with your hermeneutics. I give you that. Out of your own context and sister Laban. I give you that. But you also, if you want to be exegetically clear, is to understand the character of the God that we serve. And the character of the God that we serve is not like us. Let me see if I can make it live. Uh, Reverend Harris, stand up. Stand, stand, stand. Let's stop stand up. You see, the human character is that, yeah, if Reverend Harris gets in a fight with me, but she's friend with Sister Hopper, now she wants Sister Hopper to hate me too. It's like, why are you talking to him? Don't you don't talk to him anymore? You can be seated. That's human character. But that's not God's character. God does not allow you to influence how God feels about me. Let me see if I can make it here. Which means I'm still God's child. And since God does not pick and choose over which children or friends he loves and does not love, what God can do for one child, God can do for another. So even if my name never shows up and no weapon formed against you, I'm God's child. And because I'm God's child, I can claim it as my promise. When I read the scripture that says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy, it may never call my name. But because I'm God's child, I can take it as my promise. But my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus may never have my name in it. But I can claim it. Whew. Come here, come here, come here. Let me see if I can make it live. <laughs> my, my, my mother, I ain't called her name in a minute. You know I'm Gus's baby boy. My my mama raised seven kids. She did not have the most elegant foods, and some of that food, I don't even know what it was, but it was sufficient. But if mama said, children, the food is ready, I didn't say, well, she didn't call my name. 
I recognize I'm part of the family. So you don't have to call my name. Whatever you say about the family, I'm one of them. And even if I'm the baby boy, it does not matter because in mama's eyesight, I'm just as good as the oldest. Help me, somebody. And you got to embrace the promise. You got to keep telling yourself, God, I know my name is not right here, but you did promise this to your children. And because you promised this to your children, I is your child. When you hear the no, embrace the promise. So you got to be able to say the no to the no. I may not be able to get it through you, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to get it. Maybe you won't finance the home, but it doesn't mean it won't be financed. And if God wants to give it to me in cash, God can do it that way too. Embrace, I'm almost done. Embrace the assurance. Embrace the promise. And then when you get that no, here's the hard part. Embrace the process. Deacon Eden, you're right, keep it stepping. Embrace the process. I, 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 I create a word again. Your nose. That's not a word I know. Your nose are also part of the process. Here is where we make the mistake. We see the no as the end of the process. Rather than just a no as part of Help me preach here. The no is not intended to stop you. Because when God told you what God was going to do, God was fully aware that the no was coming. And what God is saying in essence, they are stopping you now, but I'm not. Exodus 3, 19 through 22, but says, but I know, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will. Stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. Let me, let me do something that's grammatically incorrect. Can you put that verse, that verse still up? Let me do something that's grammatically incorrect. Okay. You see the verse says, but I know mm -hmm. that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him, period. Yeah. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptian with all the wonders. Let me reread the sentence incorrectly. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Here's the way I want to read it. I want to jump over the first three, four, but I know. And I want to start with T-A-G. The king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him, so I will. I want to read it one more time. I want to have y'all got it. The king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him, so I will. <laughs> Let me read it one more time. Almost everybody got it. The king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will. So now Moses, if you're wondering why when you asked me my name, I didn't confine myself because this verse was coming up after a while. And so I don't know what I may have to use to get this Egypt to come to his senses. So he will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So... I will. Wherever you have been, whatever no you have gotten, God is saying to you, I'm not done. I'm not through. I'm not finished with the process. So let me, and I'm done. Let me finish my story from my denial 
of acceptance into college. I did not stop. With what I felt, God was calling me to do. I didn't like it. I start walking around here saying, God said no, that's fine with me. No. I know church folk, I am one. And we'll pass stuff off like it doesn't hurt. When it's when the no comes, it hurts. I wanted to go to Mobile College. I wanted to stay in Mobile. But I didn't stop my pursuit. So I applied to two colleges. After that, right. Patrick it was Patrick Henry Junior Community College, right. Right. and it was Selma University. I didn't want to go to either. Patrick Henry was 18 miles from Beatrice. That's like still being in Beatrice. <laughs> I wanted to be in Mobile. Mobile. Selma University was a slightly large city, but I didn't want to go to Selma. I wanted to hang out in Mobile. But I applied to both, got accepted into both. Can I just tell you what God did? Help me, Holy Ghost. When I left high school, my writing was jacked up. I could barely write a sentence and I couldn't write an essay. It was jacked up. But when I got to Patrick Henry Community College, a little white man who always held his hand around his head. Matter of fact, if you took his class by the end of the semester, you were doing. But he took time and taught me how to write. How to be descriptive in my writing, how to be creative in my writing. He taught me how to write. Then I went on up to Selma University. I went to two schools at the same time. Wow. Yeah, that's what I was young then. <laughs> two schools at the same time. And at Selma, I met Dr. Cleveland, who invested in my preaching. Amen. And met a white Southern Baptist preacher whose name was Fred Chestnut, who, when he retired, gave me all of his New Testament materials. God took a moment that I thought was a no. It was simply a no from there. Because when God shifted and allowed me to see what God was doing in the process, now help me, somebody. Now, I'm not bragging. I'm just testifying. God gave me the opportunity to go to Vanderbilt, the seminary. But can I tell you how I got to Vanderbilt? I was sitting in a class in Sel Selma University. And somebody had just stuck a piece of paper on the wall that said Vanderbilt. Just stuck it on the wall. You know one of those tail things? And I just tore it off and filled it out because I was bored in class, didn't have anything else to do, and sent it off. And God opened that door. You never know what you think is a no. It's simply God saying the no does not mean you can't have it. The no simply means I'm giving it to you a different way. Help me somebody. So you need to know, come on back core group, when you hear no, the no is not to stop you. The no is not to derail you. But God says, I will because there's another way. Is there anybody in here you have wanted to give, throw in the tower? You have wanted to give up? You have wanted to take down? Because you have got no after no after no after no after no after no. But I've come to tell you, keep on embracing the assurance. Keep on embracing the promise and keep on embracing the process and watch God work. Watch God. Watch God work. Reverend, I thought the promotion was for me. 
but they said no. Reverend, I thought the job was for me. They said no. Reverend, I thought the blessing was for me. And I heard God speak with somebody said, no. Their no is not to stop you. So look your no in the face and embrace the assurance. Embrace the promise. And embrace the process to know that God is not done. This is my last thing. I'm out of here. Just as your enemy has a no. God has a yes. <laughs> God, we thank you. And we bless you. And we even thank you now for all those doors that have been closed. For all those people who told us what we could not do. And for the many times we asked for help and no was the response. Thank you for knowing that no is not designed to stop us. But you will continue to work the process. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God is exalted.